All right, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good afternoon. Uh, and we're honored to welcome Carmen Papalia today. And Carmen is a non-visual social practice artist born and based in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's joining us today as the keynote lecturer for the second annual Vine Design Workshop. And it's a five-day architectural learning event here in Coco Hall, uh, happening this Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, Papalia's wo work focuses primarily on accessibility pertaining to public space, art institutions, and visual culture. His work takes forms ranging from collaborative performances to spatial installations to public interventions that address cultural accessibility through an intersectional cross-disability lens. He advocates for expansion beyond limited frameworks of compliance-based access to broader notions of justice, empathy, and activism by and for disabled people. His conceptual framework for accessibility titled Open Access advocates for a grassroots approach to access led by those most impacted by ableism. In 2020, Papalia was awarded one of the, the, one of the 25 artists awarded the Sobe Art Award and his work has been featured in prominent institutions such as the Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Tate Liverpool, Banff Center of Arts and Creativity, among others. We think you'll enjoy learning about uh, Carmen's wide range of work today and hearing alternative per perspectives on accessibility that are pertinent to us as architects. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Carmen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Matthew, Abby, and Andrew for organizing, and everybody else for organizing, and for everybody for having me. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, well, I'm going to talk about my work as an artist. Um, I make performances, public interventions, exhibitions, all about accessibility from various lived perspectives within the disability community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the accessibility of this space before I get into my talk. Um, I think of accessibility as an ongoing effort that is guided by community needs. It's an, uh, a collective effort. So in a way, we are all helping maintain the accessibility of this space. And um, I'd also just like to say that this space um, is, I, it is disability informed. Um, I want us to think about how we can center disability. Um, today, um, I, I, I think, you know, I believe we can center disability all the time, but it's very difficult. So um, i just like us to think about that concept maybe a little bit over the next few days and today in our sessions. Um, I'm going to start by uh, modeling an access practice that we do in disability-led spaces called an access check. And it's just um, a time for, well, it usually happens before we get to the business of what our meeting is about. And um, it's just a time for anybody in the room with access needs to share those. Um, it allows people who are um, you know, with the capacity to offer support uh, to know where to devote their attention. It shifts the energy and the power in the room. And um, it's a place where people can like describe themselves for other non-visual folks. Um, they can say their pronouns and the words that they use to uh, uh, call parts, call their bodies. Um, and it's just a thing that I think creates some closeness. Um, and so I'm just going to model that practice now. And I'll start by saying it's Carmen speaking. Um, I'm visiting today from the stolen and unsurrendered land of the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil and Stolo people where I was born and live as an uninvited guest. Um, this, uh, where I'm from is colonial, colonially known as Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and I live in the Hastings Sunrise neighborhood with my wife and cl collaborator, Kristen, and our four-year-old daughter, Pearl. Um, we live a, a, a block away from the park where my parents met over 40 years ago. Um, at this time of year, Vancouver, um, is, I, well, the cherry blossoms are blooming all over the city. I love this time of year. It makes the air heavy and um, fragrant in this way that I love. And um, it's short-lived as well due to our long rainy season as well. 
Um, I'll give it visual description. Um, I'm a 41-year-old artist. Um, I'm white with olive complexion. Um, I have ancestry from Greece and Italy. Um, I have black hair, a beard. Today, I am wearing a uh, gray button shirt, um, brown pants, brown boots, uh, a wool flat cap, or not, uh, yeah, a wool cap uh, that's green. And um, I have a Pendleton jacket on um, that's gray wool with buttons on it. I'm holding my detection cane, which is black graphite with silver um, kind of joiners and a black uh, rubber handle. And um, yeah, what, what might not be as visible, though, is uh, the pain that I'm carrying in my spine and my joints. Um, I don't usually use diagnostic language to describe myself, but here I feel comfortable saying that I have sickle cell and um, have a pretty uh, significant chronic pain. So I usually like to say when I'm in pain because it affects my uh, processing and my inf information recall. So I'm just going to be gentle with myself. And um, other than that, I, I don't use words like blind or visually impaired to describe myself. Um, I think of myself as a non-visual learner or non-visual artist. And um, I think that's pretty much it I have to, uh, in terms of what I have to say about accessibility. Um, thanks for listening. And, um, and check. So I'm going to get into my talk now. And I'm going to start with a video that I made in 2015. And um, it was from a time where I was working with the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And um, you're going to hear the voice of Cheryl Green, who, is, uh, who described the video for me. And um, yeah, we'll just watch it, and then I'll talk about it afterwards. There's a couple of videos that maybe could be heard. Sure. Sorry, I can, you know what? I can, uh, I'll show. I'm going to show a work, uh, another work, while we're working out the sound, because there are, is sound <laughs> to some of these videos. So um, if, if that's OK, I'm just going to. So as I said, I use a, a black graphite cane. I peeled all the white and red tape off of it at one point um, to turn down the volume on the message that the cane is constantly transmitting, which for me is, I'm blind and I need help, which I isn't usually often, you know, is, isn't necessarily the case. I don't, I don't always need help. So at a point in time, I just peeled all of the white and red tape off of my cane. Um, this is another cane that I made. Um, and I made this in like 2009. And uh, I'm just unfurling it right now. And it has many segments to it. Um, it is about a 15 foot mobility cane um, <laughs> with a red tip on the end. It's white and red. It's I, I'm not hitting the ceiling right now, but it feels like I could be soon. Um, let's see if I can lean it on the wall here. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so I made this cane in 2009. It was when I started using a white cane. Um, around that time, and I was thinking about how the cane, um, the standard issue cane, and the services that we get as people who are low vision and blind and, and, um, and visually impaired kind of are meant to help us uh, re-enter a non-disabled culture and be with non-disabled peers. So I, I really thought of the cane in some ways as separating me from uh, my community. And I had to come to terms with that in certain ways. And what I ended up doing is making this long cane that would um, comically long, and um, I would go on walks with it and occupy the entire sidewalk. So people, as I was tapping it from side to side, people would have to like jump out of my way. Um, I was recently in Chicago, and, and maybe this is the best review I've, I've got so far, but a young disabled person <laughs> said that um, uh, teens online say that this long king is king shit, um, which <laughs> I was really tickled to hear. I, I think that's a good thing. Um, how are we doing? The audio. Okay. We can we can go back to that video, but can you uh, advance my image, maybe, or is that hard to do while you're? Okay. Signal turns red to green. Carmen crosses a narrow street. Rounds the corner past the Linden Buddhist Center. Camera on his chest points up to his face. The bumpy curb cut. A bank of tiger orange doors with cut out windows. View down the cane. It taps an orange door, then a post, and more doors. Carmen scans left and right, approaches a crosswalk. car stops quickly. A sapphire blue metal fence encloses a lawn in front of brick apartments. The cane as it peeks in and around bikes chained to a metal fence near a tube station. Walking in a tunnel past others dressed for cool weather. People stroll past to his left and right leaving him a wide path. Now sunlight streams in from one side. makes his way up the subway station stairs. On a plaza, Carmen explores the shiny surface of a transit map on a tall kiosk. Heads down a brick sidewalk toward a wide intersection. An angular metal bollard stands waist high, gives it a few taps, moves on, crossing a brick road in front of iconic black London taxis. Taps to his right, and a weathered bench on his left, then a wall. At a bright red metal structure, glass panels make up the side, a telephone perched within. At the front of the phone booth, he pokes and scrapes the boxy structure. Runs the cane up and down. People relax on the steps to the Victoria and Albert Museum. Cane tip runs along the riser of a cement step. Climbs the steps to the museum's grand entrance. Fade to black. Credits. Producer Peter Kelleher. Motion Media. Digital Media. VNA. Filmed and edited by Marco Carini. Logo for Shape Arts and VNA. Audio description by Cheryl Green. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so that uh, video was about my uh, uh, my process getting to the front lobby of the, the gallery I was working with. And um, I'd just like to show it because I think a lot of us 
spend a lot of uh, energy and there's a lot of labor that goes into getting places. And um, I just like to show that at the beginning um, of some of my talks. Um, next image, please, which is, um, yeah, so this image is also from 2009. And uh, this is before I thought of myself as an artist. Uh, it, 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 was, it was something that I did to kind of better understand what adopting the label disabled, um, how that would change my uh, position in my community. Um, and so at the time, I didn't really know other people who were disabled. I couldn't have conversations with other disabled people. But I did have a good friend uh, from college that I had gone backpacking through Europe with named Elliot, who is on screen right now. And um, Elliot is not disabled, but um, at one point, I asked him if I could disable him. And um, for some reason, he said yes. <laughs> And, um, and so what I did is I affixed this large corrugated plastic sign to him um, and, and, and zap strapped it to him in ways that would restrict his movement and also impair his vision and his hearing in certain ways. And uh, he had to do his daily routine um, just with this large label that said disabled on it. It has the words disabled on in, in large blocky black letters. Um, here, he is selecting a beverage out of, uh, at a supermarket, out of, out, out of a cooler. And, um, you know, he also tried to board the bus uh, that day. He was told that he was too much of an obstacle for other people to board the bus. He had to uh, kind of <laughs> maneuver underneath doorways uh, because the label was so big. He was also a spectacle for others. Um, people, um, would ask him things similar to what they would ask me when I was using my detection cane, like, what is your disability? Can I talk to you about my disability? Um, and um, yeah, and he also had lunch at a cafe and had to like uh, fold himself up to fit in a booth as well. So we really just used this, this, this experience as an opportunity to start a conversation about what it meant to be disabled. And how did that change one's access to public space? Of course, Elliot had to deal with uh, and navigate the uh, fixtures and infrastructure. Um, but it also, um, being disabled, even in this way, simulated, um, really revealed cultural and social biases regarding disability through his visibility, through the disruption he caused. Um, OK, and I'll go to my next image. This is an image from a walking tour that I've been leading since 2010. And uh, I've led countless walks um, in various cities around the world. Um, and uh, this walk, um, people line up behind me, link arms, and shut their eyes. And then I take them on about an hour long or longer walk through the city um, or a rural space. Um, and um, they're just supposed to shut their eyes until I tell them to open them. Um, and this work is, uh, I think of it as exercise for our non-visual senses. It's um, not necessarily a walk in my shoes, because there's a lot that I can't really share about being a non-visual uh, learner or having pain by just asking someone to shut their eyes. Um, but I really think of this as like practice you, uh, for, you know, practice for our non-visual senses, something that we don't often um, dedicate time and space to in our daily routines. Um, I also think this work is about the support network that coalesces when a group of people come together around the same agreement or activity. Um, my largest group to date has been 90 participants. Um, that was in 2017 in Tennessee. And um, you can imagine when the group is that large, um, uh, we really become a disruption within public space, uh, especially when I'm like, walking through uh, you know, New York City, and I'm having to cross busy streets, and motorists are like honking at us. Um, and that project's called Blindfield Shuttle. Next image, please. Mm, this image is from 2013, when I got the uh, opportunity to work with the Guggenheim. Um, the, um, yeah, so I, I was asked to work um, with the Mind's Eye program at the Guggenheim. And it's a very unique program at a museum. Um, it's an internal consultancy for 
uh, that includes um, members of the blind and low vision community. And they're asked about the kinds of experiences that they want to have in the museum. Um, and then um, those proposals are advocated for and implemented. And there's this direct kind of feedback between community and then programming, which is unfortunately rare to find. Um, so with the Mind's Eye program, I uh, produce this project called The Touchy Subject. Um, and the touchy subject in the museum is that you can't really touch anything. Um, so what I did was I asked for, I negotiated for uh, tactile access to a few objects in the collection. And then we worked with those objects in a studio setting with art educators. And they uh, spent time with their eyes closed, with their hands on these objects, and tried to develop words and vocabulary for what these objects felt like, um, using simile, metaphor, analogy. And they just kind of, um, once we had this vocabulary, um, it then informed these public tours in the subsequent days, um, where any visitor could come and uh, link arms with a staff member, shut their eyes, and then their hand would be directed to tactile points of interest. And that included the um, objects that we had uh, uh, had access to, which were um, uh, made available within the galleries, um, as well as the building itself. The, the Guggenheim is a large sculpture, after all, so feeling it was a, a different uh, way into the space for many people. And since the Guggenheim is a, a tourist destination, it was some people's first experience of the gallery, uh, having, having to feel their way through it. Um, the image on screen is of someone on a tour, and their hand is being directed to um, uh, a point in the rotunda on the floor that's marked with two dots. And if you stand in that spot and project your voice, it's, um, it's as if your voice is uh, in, like surrounding you. It's an acoustic feature just having to do with the roundness of the space and, and, the, and the, the height of the ceiling. And um, when I was at the Guggenheim, I was thinking about the, the, op the options that I usually have uh, to participate in the museum um, as someone who's non-visual. Usually, I can listen to an audio tour, maybe on a device of some kind. I can listen to a descriptive tour if it's offered. Sometimes these are offered like once a month, if at all. And sometimes there's things to touch. Um, but really, there's no more than three options that are. Um, and I started to think of that as like a predetermined path for my access, a container that was kind of restrictive and patronizing. And I started to um, wonder what accessibility could be if it was approached as a creative process. Um, and so I'll show you my, the next image, which brings me to this pro project. Um, so this is a collaboration from 2015 with Sarah Hendren and Oled, Ol, um, students at Olin College of Engineering just out of Boston. And so Sarah um, is a designer and asked me, um, she invited me to develop an alternative mobility device or assistive device. And I talked to her about my thoughts about the white cane. And I said, well, maybe instead of making something that, that would you know, kind of be a way for me to advocate for myself, I'd like something um, that I could maybe um, use to um, engage my non-visual senses. I wanted to be able to creatively engage with my surroundings. So that was the starting point. And here, we're in a, a studio setting, and students are developing uh, basic prototypes from a list of, I think it was 300 conceptual cane ideas that they came up with. And these canes included anything from a single-use cane that I would have to throw away after I used, um, to a cane that left a trail of ink. Um, and so on screen, I'm using this cane. Um, well, my cane they rigged up. Um, these students were just working with what they had on campus. And so at, in their dorm rooms, they had a bunch of guitar equipment, including an amp and some Fender guitar pedals, uh, distortion and looping, delay, that kind of stuff. And they just um, put a contact mic at, on the tip of my cane, and um, the output was the amp. And so I could, like, it would, uh, it, it would translate texture into sound, and then I could manipulate those sounds with the pedals. And it was super fun to use, and, um, and that was our first step. <laughs> Well, that, that was the long, long cane falling down. Um, uh, yeah, and so that was our first session. And um, 
the next thing I'm going to show is is a, a video, and this is a video of what they called the wander cane, and um, it would take the user where it wanted to go instead of letting the user go where where they wanted to go. Whoa. There's no description to this video, but you can kind of hear what's going on. You're just kind of cruising. Oh, no. It's a little more. Cane breaks at the end of the video. Um, and that's the wander cane. And so eventually we started developing the sound cane into like a more advanced prototype. And I'm just going to share a video now of, um, of a student working on the modulation device that was made from the uh, Fender guitar parts, uh, or the, yeah, the, the pedals. goes on for a while. But I, I, they would just send me these videos every couple weeks. And you, they're obviously having fun with this project. Um, the next video is once the cane was uh, you know, more, uh, more together, this is a student stress testing the cane. Sort of a lightsaber effect, maybe. Um, and the last image there, it's, it's a studio image of the, the final version of uh, what I call acoustic mobility device 1.0. And um, this is, uh, you, you, you can see the, the Fender guitar parts in here. Um, there's a black cane. Um, and uh, this thing is supposed to be portable. It has like a belt hook on it, but it's a little heavy and cumbersome. Um, I also have trouble traveling with it because when I'm going through TSA, it's literally like a handmade electronic device, so I already always have to get my bag checked. So the idea is now that I'll be working on 2.0 that will be just like a little easier to, uh, to, to travel with and plug and play. Um, and that's acoustic mobility device. Um, next image, please. Hmm, I'm forgetting which. Oh yeah, oh cool. Okay, so this is a, a piece called the International Icon for Access. Um, or no, I think it's called the, the Accessible Icon Project. And it was by Sarah Hendren and collaborators. And this image, it's it's kind of a reimagining or, or uh, redesign, I think more of a reimagining of the, um, international icon for access, like the wheelchair symbol. And um, in this image, the, um, the, the, the figure looks as if they are moving on their own, maybe with a bit more agency or autonomy. And um, in 2014, I saw this uh, piece um, at MoMA in New York uh, when I was there uh, uh, for a visit. And, um, I started thinking about this in 2015 again, and I just was like, how strange is it that we mark accessible space with a sign? Like, um, and I, I, I was wondering, like, you know, I, accessibility, like, it requires people. Like, it, it requires people in, like, trusting and caring relationships. And, um, and I started to think about the idea of, of accessibility being temporary and really fragile and hard to maintain. Um, and, and something that maybe wasn't possible to achieve on an ongoing basis in perpetuity. Um, and I ended up writing um, 
a short piece called Open Access that was my personal position statement on the topic of, a topic of accessibility. And it includes um, five uh, short tenants. And I'll, I'll have them read out uh, right now. Testing, good. Open access relies on those present, what their needs are, and how they can find support with each other and in their communities. It is a perpetual negotiation of trust between those who practice support as a mutual exchange. Open access is radically different than a policy that temporarily removes a barrier to participation for a group with definitive needs. It acknowledges that everyone carries a body of local knowledge and is an expert in their own right. Open access is the root system of embodied learning. It cultivates trust among those involved and enables each member to self-identify and occupy a point of orientation that centers complex embodiment. Open access disrupts the disabling conditions that limit one's agency and potential to thrive. It reimagines normalcy as a continuum of embodiments, identities, realities, and learning styles and operates under the premise that interdependence is a central, uh, central to the radical restructuring of power. Finally, open access is a temporary, collectively held space where participants can find comfort in disclosing their needs and preferences with one another. It is a responsive support network that adapts as needs and available resources change. Thank you. Yeah, and that was just a way for me to describe accessibility beyond a, a, a model that relies on a le legal or regula regulatory compliance. Um, and so uh, around the time that I wrote that, I started sharing it with people. Um, I'd print copies out for people in, in the audience when I was giving talks. And um, my friend, Megan Arnie Johnston, she was the director at the Model Contemporary Art Center in Sligo, Ireland at the time. And she really resonated with some of these ideas. And um, she started a residency at the museum called um, the Bureau of Radical Accessibility. And it was just a residency where any artist could address the topic of accessibility from, from one whatever perspective. Um, and so I was one of the first um, set of artists that came through the residency. And I'm going to show you a couple images of the work that I did while I was there. Um, this next image is um, of me affixing a red string to wood paneling above me. And um, this project, I, I basically just uh, tied a red paracord to fixtures that already existed in the space, including like table legs, handrails, um, like little screws in the wall, um, anything really I could find. And these, uh, these, this cord indicated my most uh, commonly used uh, routes through the building, um, from like, say, the cafe to the upstairs gallery, um, from the elevator to the restroom, or wherever I really needed to go. And um, I found it difficult to navigate this space on my own. And um, I just thought to implement this as a temporary system of access for myself. I would just use it to feel my way through the building. And um, it was something that I could easily install and then deinstall, um, although it did stay up for about a month after I left. And um, yeah, and that is a red string. Um, I don't really have a, a, a set name for that project, but um, next image, please. This is an, uh, another project that I did while I was at the Model Center in Sligo. Um, um, when I was there, I saw this um, exhibition that were paintings from the permanent collection. And they were all hung in, at, in this gallery at like a, a typical height for a standing viewer. And um, I asked that they all be lowered so they're only uh, like inches from the ground. And um, I was trying to trouble the um, access for like the standing viewer. And so they would have to like like problem solve a way to comfortably view the work because that really is the situation that disabled folks are in all the time. And um, while it did trouble access for the standing viewer, um, it opened access up for people who were uh, wheelchair users, for kids, and people of short stature as well. 
Um, and I named this piece um, for a friend in Portland, um, uh, a, a disabled dancer named Eric Ferguson. And Eric was my first point of contact when I moved to Portland to go to grad school and introduced me to the disability arts movement. And we would meet and talk about disruptive uh, museum interventions, the kinds of things that we would do if we had the chance. And so I called this uh, piece for Eric Ferguson. Um, next image, please. What is this? It looks like a laser with a bunch of mirrors. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. OK, this is um, these. I'm going to talk about uh, two commissions that I made for the BAMP Center for Arts and Creativity in 2019. Um, this piece that's on screen is called Ocular Centrism. And it's, um, it consists of 13 freestanding mirrored pillars that are about 10 feet tall and the width of a body on all sides. And um, uh, surrounding them are additional mirrors on the walls. And they're, meant, they're installed to, to make a, a confusing visual um, experience. So like for people who rely on vision, um, walking through this space is, is a bit difficult or disorienting. And then I've, I've installed a red uh, uh, string through the space implying a route through as well. Um, you could go to the next image. This is another piece from that show, and it's a collaboration with an animator named Heather Kai Smith. Um, Heather's practice is concerned with, well, it involves rotoscoping, so that uh, she uses like document documentation of protest, either video or photos, and then she draws over them. Um, this image is in red pencil, and um, the, the animation that it's from, um, I wrote the script and narrated, and it's a, it was about open access and then various uh, points in disability activist history. And um, the image that served as the source for, for this piece was um, documentation of the 504 sit-in in 1977 where um, groups of disabled people, uh, disability rights activists, occupied a federal building in San Francisco. Um, and they were, they were uh, it was a sit-in for um, amendments to the Rehabilitation Act, which preceded the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, next, oh, I guess I'll say, um, this, so that mirrored installation that we looked at, that was my first collaboration with Michael Liss of Good Weather Studio in Vancouver, and who's an architect and designer that I've been working with on my installation work. And, um, and I'm just gonna read, so me and Michael, uh, our, our most current collaboration is provisional structures. And um, I'm gonna show you a few images from a couple different versions of provisional structures. And, um, but first I'll have um, a description of uh, an architectural drawing that Michael made for me. He write, wrote the description, um, a visual description for me, so I'll, have, I'll, I'll just share that with you now. This image shows a perspective view as the visitor approaches the second entrance to the installation. No, it's, um, it, we don't actually have an image for this description, but yeah, I just thought I'd, I, I'd share it as a description. Okay. From this second entrance, the visitor is invited to proceed beneath the ramp at the point that the ramp is high enough for a person standing to walk safely underneath. The visitor is guided by a red string to the inner circle in a quarter turn of the diameter of the ramp to emerge near the center of the room. Inside the ring of mirrors and near the innermost circle of benches beneath the acoustical hemisphere. Yeah, so this is a, like w one example of the visual descriptions that Michael wrote for me. He also made scale model uh, uh, models of our, our architect these proposals, and um, our process is very like di dialogue based and iterative, uh, as you'll see. And um, so my next image shows um, this this uh, what Michael was writing about fully realized, and this is provisional structures at the McKenzie Art Gallery on Treaty 4 territory in Saskatchewan. Um, and I'll just take a minute to say that, like, an often unseen part of my practice is, and, and a, a really important part of provisional structures, too, is, um, is behind closed doors work that I do with museums. And, and I usually work with museums um, in these sessions to 
um, advance their accessibility practices and their dialogue around accessibility. And um, I think this work is often more complicated and com um, more complicated than the work I end up showing, but it's necessary in order for me to be able to present my work. And it's, I think, necessary for the institutions to be able to um, appropriately host myself, uh, any collaborators that I'm working with, and also um, the wider disability community. Um, and so, and I think it's because there are so few of us in leadership roles in cultural institutions, um, showing disability art requires a lot of learning on behalf of the institution. Um, so the image on screen, I'll, I'll get back to describing it. So this is provisional structure one. And um, here um, you, uh, is uh, Nicole Nugent, um, who is seated. Um, she is the curator of uh, of education at the McKenzie Art Gallery, and she's seated on sandbags that are referencing disaster relief, um, and they all are printed with a stencil and say open access on them, and she's sitting next to a gallery attendant named Dave who's in a, uh, using a wheelchair. Um, they're sitting underneath um, the acoustical dome, and it's looming above. It looks a little futuristic and skeletal. It's made of cardboard. It's gray. And inside it, um, the dome, it, it, it's kind of like a, you know, say an orange cut in half. Um, and inside the dome is a black sound dampening material. And um, around this seating area are 13 freestanding mirrors with like a simple wooden frame holding them up and a sandbag as well. And uh, projected from the center of the dome is, an, uh, is, is a presentation that I selected from a, a 2020 uh, Disability Justice Conference um, that was organized by the Portland Disability Justice Collective. And the talk um, was by an artist named Vo, whose work is, um, they're an organ-based artist, and their work is about the various intersections and impacts of trauma. And they were talking about trauma-informed care um, through the lens of disability justice. And their talk really resonated with me on a deep level on account of my own experience of medical trauma. So I asked them to, um, if I could include their talk as a centerpiece to this, this installation. Um, and I'll go into the next image now. This is a wide angle view of the structure, provisional structure one. And um, in this view, you can see a taut red cord directing visitors to the entrance to um, a, a monumental spiraling accessible ramp made of scaffolding. Um, the, uh, the, the ramp goes up to over 12 feet tall. Um, as visitors ascend, it creaks and shifts as it bears weight. And uh, it affords the viewer a few different uh, views of the space, one being of a work by um, the artist Jess Sash. Um, and Jess, the bench for Jess's work is visible in this image. Um, um, but the work is not. And the work included, um, it was a wall hung piece and it included over 800 bronze plaques, um, all arranged on the wall in sort of like a grid, sort of like a donor wall at a museum. And all of the plaques said, I need a minute on them. And um, this was referencing sort of like maybe some slowness, asking visitors to consider the pace of the disabled body. Um, and that was provisional structures at the McKenzie. I'm going to show um, now provisional structures at the Vancouver Art Gallery, um, which is currently up on display. And um, I'm going to start with this image, which is an, uh, uh, an image of the, as you enter the, the first of three rooms that this gallery, that the show is in. Um, in the interest of time, I'm only going to be able to talk the about the work that I produce for provisional structures. Um, but I also curated the show and, um, and supported project development with each artist as well. And um, the show is called Car um, Provisional Structures, Carmen Papalia with co-conspirators. And my co-conspirators here are um, Rebel Fayola Rose, um, founder of Disability Justice Dreaming, Grant Miller and Jonathan Lee of The Curiosity Paradox. And... Um, uh, Gabrielle Peters and um, and Catherine Frazee of the Disability Filibuster, and Heather Kaismith, as well as Sharona Franklin, who's a sculptor. Um, 
And so this image shows a, um, the, the entrance into the show. Uh, hanging from above in the ceiling is a, um, what looks like a, a tent hanging from the ceiling. It's sagging from the force of gravity. Um, in fact, it is a parachute, one in a series that me and um, animator Heather Smith made. Um, this one has the phrase, open access is a temporary, collectively held space. Um, on it in, in sans serif lettering. It's black, and they're sewn on these letters. Um, and um, I'm just going to go to the next image. I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm tight on time here. Um, this is an image of provisional structure two. So it builds on the concept and design of provisional structure one. And um, here you can notice the, that the dome, the acoustical dome from provisional structure one, has become an over 20 foot tall structure um, that made of sound dampening um, panels. They are being supported on the outside by 11 wooden structures. And um, peeking in, you can see um, some sandbag seating inside, as well as a, a video monitor. Um, this space was designed um, as a viewing area for um, over 40 hours of live stream content from uh, 2021. Uh, a protest called the D Disability Filibuster. Um, and so, and, and I designed the space after my own experience uh, viewing the filibuster. I would usually um, log on at night and, and zoom in at night, and I would, um, so the, sh the, the space is dimly lit. Um, it also um, privileges sound as a, an entry point to the content, although there is um, the content on the monitor with ASL and captioning as well. Um, and, um, and heating pads and, um, and weighted blankets are also available, which is <laughs> my preferred way to view most things. Um, and um, at the center of the space, there is a, um, a sandbag with six black foil balloons moored to it. And the balloons are riding out, um, rising out of the oculus at the, cent at the top of the structure. And I just have a, a really short content notice about overdose death. I'm going to talk about um, overdose for the next two minutes. Um, so these balloons actually represent the daily number of BC residents who die of overdose. Um, there was a conversation about how harm reduction is accessibility and how harm reduction is disability justice during the filibuster. And I thought to highlight this with this installation. And these balloons actually correspond to an additional 840 balloons that are installed in the windows of the Vancouver Art Gallery outside. And I'll show you those. Um, it's my next image. And these, are, uh, these represent the number of people who are expected to die of overdose over the course of the exhibition, which ends April 16th. Um, um, uh, this image shows the uh, gallery windows full of black balloons. They are against a stark white background, and they're kind of crowded and tangled. Um, this image isn't, isn't animated, but they're slightly animated, usually because of air circulation. And um, when I'm touring this work, I usually um, let people know that the Vancouver Art Gallery was a former courthouse building. Um, and I know, I know that's a bit heavy to end on, so I did, I did include a poem for us to listen to um, before I end my talk. So I'd like to just share this if I do have a, a minute extra. Um, and this is from a series of poems that I wrote about the places where my work was shown. And um, they're kind of like instructional poems that uh, maybe uh, invite people to navigate uh, curated spaces with their eyes closed. And so this is about the Anderson Gallery at Drake University in Des Moines. First set of doors. Five steps in a rail in the middle. On the left, a plaque listing the board of trustees and a sign with the current exhibitions. Another set of glass doors. Print corridor, about 20 works on display. Front desk. Lobby. Large glass doorway with Dutch to steel design. Set of doors to the corridor or to the courtyard. Pond, cafe tables, trees, sculpture. Keep going through the main lobby. And go to the right of the glass doorway to another doorway. Entrance to the main gallery. 
Shut your eyes. Count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The muscles that keep your eyes shut begin to relax, and you are present. Now stop counting. The things you tied a string to on your way in, don't miss them. Narrow room opens into acoustic vaulted ceiling. Loud voice kid shuffling, rustling, paper shuffling. Sound events reveal dimension carry like precious objects, inform movement, temporary walls, vibration holding space, like installation, a concrete block suspended from the ceiling, evokes color, glowing yellow, a brown green, cicada tree, cicada tree, after image, blurry canopy, cluster camera flash, makes shapes disappear. disappears in an open field. You can walk freely for 10 minutes and end within steps of the last thing you saw. In this In an open field, you can walk freely for 10 minutes and end within steps of the last thing you saw. In this non-visual space, if you feel the walls or work on display are too close and you can't wave your arms or move freely without hitting anything, make a slapping sound against your leg or tuck the paper under your arm. And when your foot moves, clap. Then sweep your foot, clap, clap and back again. Floor, your palms, our tongues holding reference to the door frame, to walls and wood grain, to the corners drawing your curiosity, to the curated object, object, object. Now lead with an open hand and start a step, clap. Sweep your foot out. Feel for the obstacle side of a wall. Skim your fingertips like fine bristles. Brush, step, clap. Brush edge, step, clap. Brush, step, clap. Brush, edge, step, clap. Brush, step, clap. Brush. I can take a question or two, maybe. You all let me know when I'm finished. <laughs> I'll take questions until you say so. Also, can't see your hands up. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, can, can we take the mic off you so I can mm -hmm. run it around? We only have one, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Any questions from anybody? That's okay. I get my exercise. Hey, Carmen. It's Elizabeth McLean. Hi. Hey. <laughs> nice to see you at Virginia Tech. <laughs> so I've got a question for you. I'm hoping it's not put you on the spot. What do you do when a sighted person approaches you and says they want to design for folks who are blind or low vision, or they want to do a project about folks that are blind or low vision? 
Take care of the long cane. Thank you. I mean, th this happens a lot because, like, there's not so many blind designers. Um, I think because their access is so bad and it's handled so poorly at, uh, you know, places of higher education. And so, I mean, blind architect. <laughs> I guess students in architecture architecture school who are blind reach out to me and say, like, I'm the only one um, like me in my program. They've never had a blind student before. What do I do? And I, I, I really think that if there is, um, I mean, I have some ideas on what they can do. But I also think in the situation that you're, you're um, asking about, where designers are, are making for or um, doing projects about people who are blind, I think they really need to include them in meaningful ways as part of the project development and decision making. Um, I don't think, and, and our com community too is is not a monolith. Like um, there's so many degrees of vision and uh, non-vision, I guess too, um, and so many preferences within our community that differ. Um, some people have you know, are blind and neurodivergent, or blind and, like me, have pain. Like, how do you design for those intersections? You need to meet people with those intersections <laughs> and have them be meaningfully um, involved in the process. Um, that's kind of the best situation. I, I would say the best situation is we have our people um, who have the uh, uh, qualifications and training um, that, that they're able to get in a way that's accessible for them. And then we design for ourselves. Um, I think we can still design for ourselves even without those, um, those credits, maybe. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's not legal. I, I don't know much about, uh, <laughs> about building codes and everything. But um, maybe that's what we can ask non-disabled people to do is like, hey, can you tell me about the building codes? Because I want to design this. Um, anyways, that's my meandering answer to your question. Thank you so much. There's one back there. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and doing this. Um, my question is, in your life experience, uh, was there a time where you found a space particularly refreshing in its uh, being accommodating, whether intentionally or like if unintentional, even better? And if so, uh, what about that space? Yeah, so I think I I really started having an OK time at school in grad school, where I was able to work with like a small cohort and have the like support of an advisor that you know really wanted to support my learning as I was self-directing it. I, I I was the only person who was disabled in my program, but it was it was arranged in such a way where. You know, I had a lot of support, and I didn't have to go through the Disability Resource Center. So the most, like, you know, surprising thing about that was that, like, I, I mean, which is sad, is that I never had been in a supportive community like that before. And I, you know, I almost dropped out of my undergrad, um, bef you know, before my last 12 credits um, because I was running into barriers. So, like, a, a supportive learning community was very refreshing for me when I went into grad school. And I think it was the only way that I could have done it. Um, and something that was surprisingly, like just in the way that it was designed maybe, uh, I don't know, I'm just thinking of like enjoyable like public spaces that are really cool to listen to. Like, um, OK, this was a neat, ex OK, one of my friends um, in Portland, he took me um, when I was living there to Pioneer Square. 
in Portland near my birthday. My birthday's on like December 20th. So there was this event happening on my birthday called Tuba Christmas. And over 200 tuba players were playing Christmas carols in this like public square. And as you stood inside of this area, like you could feel the music through your chest. It was like very tactile. And um, I just, yeah, that was just such an enjoyable acoustic uh, kind of sound uh, memory for me. Um, hi, I'm one of the students at Blind Design and um, I had a question actually about both the uh, ab about the the fifteen foot cane. Does that actually work? Because I kind of feel like it would be like too far ahead for me to uh, do that with my cane. But I, I I don't know. I haven't actually used it. Well, you you can try it out if you want later. Um, but. I, uh, it, it, it is, isn't really functional as a cane. Like it, I can feel things 15 feet in front of me, but it's like, you know, when I'm trying to cross the street, and I only do this as a performance now, but like, you know, I'm trying to cross the street. I know where the, you know, the, the step down is, um, um, but I'm like 15 feet before I encounter it. So like, it, it is very weird. Um, yeah. It's, it's, um, I think, you know, part of that is it refers to the fact that, like, the cane is like a clumsy, clumsy signifier. It's not sure. Like, a lot of people know that it means I, you know, I'm low vision or blind or visually impaired and I need help. But, like, my cane has been mis mistaken for all sorts of things. Even when I used to use a white, white and red cane, you know, people thought, oh, is that a hiking stick? Is that a tent pole? A tripod? A weapon, you know, sword. Uh, I'm sure people here have other I examples. I had a classmate call my cane a miniature water tower. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know what a, what is a, uh, what did, oh man, there's this weird term that I never heard in someone. Is it a blah, blah, blah? And I'm trying to remember it now, but I, I mean, people always come up to me and it's like, what is that? But it's happened less and less since I stripped the tape from my cane. And, and I just want to give a little tip. So I get my canes from Ambutech um, in Winnipeg. It's this company where a lot of people get their canes. But you can request them to be any color you want in any arrangement of colors. Um, they have, and have reflective like purple, pink, like all sorts of stuff. And I just ask them to not put the tape on a graphite cane. <laughs> and, and I get like this nice black kind of shiny uh, cane back. I think that'll be all. Uh, thank you so much for joining, and it's a pleasure to have you, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.